Good morning, and welcome to worship on this first Sunday in the season of Lent. We began Lent with Ash Wednesday service, which was, uh, I think we had uh, an interesting Zoom experience. Uh, people got to see each other, talk to each other. That was pretty, uh, pretty nice. And uh, we're going to continue something like that through the Wednesdays, on the Wednesday evenings in Lent. Uh, Pastor Steve Holm is going to present a, a brief reflection on the Psalms of Lent. And uh, Joyce J- Jocelyn Obermeyer is going to offer some uh, uh, some harp music to, to reflect on, and that'll be every Wednesday evening, uh, and we'll send out a Zoom link so that you can, uh, uh, so that you can join in on that for just a brief time of reflection uh, during the Wednesdays of Lent. Uh, the day we have uh, for our worship service, uh, some great music. Uh, Henry Venanzi is doing a, an organ piece. Uh, Jill Jill Janellis Voss is doing a bell solo. Uh, Bob Strava and Jan Meyer Thompson are doing a violin and piano uh, duet. And of course, Lincoln is finishing us off uh, with a postlude. With that, let's take this time now during the prelude and prepare ourselves for worship with a time of prayer and reflection. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion.
fountain of living water. Pour out your mercy over us, our, our sins is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow the ways of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Peter, the third chapter. Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, 
who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. up my soul. My God, I put my trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love, for they are from everlasting. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O oh Lord. You are gracious and upright, O oh Lord. Therefore you teach sinners in your way. You lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All your paths, O Lord, are steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant and your testimonies. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In those days, 
Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I like camping. When I camp, I go into the wilderness as far as I can get to a place where I can sort of convince myself that no one has ever been there before. I sleep on the ground. I cook over a fire or a small backpacker's stove. And in my perfect camping experience, I meet no one other than those people who have come with me on the trip. At least, that's what I did when I was 20. When Joy started camping with me, certain accommodations had to be made. In our 50s, Joy and I were still camping, and we were still roughing it compared to most people our age, but we now were camping in Wyoming. Based on news reports, Joy developed an, an acute and probably healthy concern about bears. A new accommodation was made. We had a tent which set up in the back of our pickup truck, off the ground, and with the truck alarm button close at hand. Wild beasts. When you are far off the beaten path in the wilderness, wild beasts are the one unknown which you cannot control. They're the thing that makes us afraid. Nothing disturbs a peaceful night under the stars by the dying embers of a warm, cheerful campfire more thoroughly than a strange sound in the darkness just beyond the reach of your flashlight. What's the picture in your head of Jesus in the wilderness with the wild beasts? Maybe it's all the art over the centuries or the Sunday school version of this story, but my immediate go-to image is an untroubled and powerful Jesus in complete control of the situation. The wild beasts are gathered around him in peaceful serenity. Sadly, this superhero image of Jesus leaves no room for his humanity. Can you imagine a Jesus who actually struggled in the wilderness? A Jesus who hurt, who hungered, who thirsted, who wept, who wrestled and suffered. Jesus, for whom the wild beasts held all of the uncertainty and mystery and potential for danger that the wild beasts hold for us. On one level, it may be a comfort to assume that Jesus' triumph over evil was a foregone conclusion. But if that's true, then this trial didn't cost him anything. Now, I get it. A part of us always longs for the muscular superhero Jesus. We want to focus on his divinity, the certainty of it, the mighty, magical promise of it. But Lent isn't a season for unshakable superheroes. It is a season for vulnerable creatures whose wilderness journeys are never really easy or straightforward. It's a season of shadow, a season when our certainties go into the fire and burn down to ash. It's a season of vulnerability, honesty, humility, and penitence. All of that is to say, to read Jesus' wilderness story as a story of easily accomplished triumph is to miss the point. Why? Because we need the Jesus of the desert. We need to know that he wrestled with real demons and real dangers during those 40 days of temptation. We need the Jesus who endured the terrain 
where the Holy Spirit and Satan and the wild beasts and the angels all resided together. Because alone, we'll never survive such a dangerous place. But with a companion, a companion who knows the way, who's been there, we will. Even Jesus' baptism, which precedes the wilderness, may not have been as tame as we are inclined to imagine it. I mean, come on, John's demeanor and his challenge, they, they weren't something that coddled people. They were something which, which caused people concern. So the Baptist, we must imagine, is, is, the baptism of Jesus is no dainty sprinkling of water, but it's rather a kind of an unceremonious dunking. Jesus' prophetic cousin may have looked a little more like this, standing waist deep in the water, stripped to the waist, filled with the fiery spirit of God. All this is punctuated by the heavens ripping apart. Then the spirit descends like a dove. And through that curtain of the sky, an unassuming bird of the air sort of flutters down. I mean, the juxtaposition could not be more clear between camel's hair and downy feathers, between rent heavens and gentle cooing. Then comes the voice, uttering the words of comfort. With you, I am well pleased. In Mark, this affirmation is for Jesus' ears alone. But then comes Mark's signature immediately, and the tone shifts. That same spirit who just alighted on Jesus now beats its wings and nips at Jesus' head, driving him into the wilderness like Hitchcock had choreographed the scene. Unlike his counterparts, Matthew and Luke, Mark offers us no colorful details about Jesus' experience in the wilderness. We don't learn what Satan's specific temptations were or how Jesus responded to them. All Mark gives us is a few sentences. The Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. It's only three short sentences, but as Mark is wont to do, he packs a world of meaning into those sentences. First, Jesus didn't choose the wilderness. Jesus didn't want to go, and it's very possible that he resisted going, but the Spirit drove him anyway. Maybe it's strange, but I find that particular detail comforting. Why? because it rings true to life. Most of the time, we don't choose to enter the wilderness. We don't volunteer for pain or loss or danger or terror. But the wilderness happens anyway. Whether it comes to us in the guise of a devastating pandemic, a frightening hospital stay, a broken relationship, a hurting child, a loss of faith. The wilderness appears unbidden and unwelcome at our doorsteps. And sometimes it is God's own spirit that drives us there. I mean, does this mean that God wants bad things to happen to us? No. That God wants us to suffer? No. But does it mean that God is ready to teach, to shape, and to redeem us even during the most barren periods of our lives? Yes. In the startling economy of God, even a dangerous desert can become holy. Even our wilderness wanderings can reveal the divine. This is not because God takes pleasure in our pain, but because we live in a chaotic, fragile, and broken world that includes deserts, and because God's modus operandi is to take the things of shadow and the things of death and wring from them resurrection. In addition, our wilderness journeys sometimes last a long while. I've never spent 40 days, six weeks almost, in solitude and silence, much less 
in a state of, of physical deprivation and danger. But I cannot imagine that Jesus' time in the wilderness passed quickly. The sense I get from Mark's gospel is that Jesus despaired of this grim place filled with wild beasts, that he experienced each day a battle of the mind, the spirit, and the body. We who live in the desert understand better than most how the landscape itself can mock one's weary senses. Its unvarying bleakness can break your spirit. For those of us who live in impatient, quick-fix cultures, this aspect of the wilderness is daunting because we tire and, and despair so quickly. Why, we ask, is this pain not ending? Why are our prayers going unanswered? Where is God? Maybe we need to ask a harder question. Why did Jesus need the wilderness? Why do we need the wilderness? When Jesus' wilderness wanderings stretched into week two, week three, week four, were the words from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, enough? Did that certain sense of his identity and belonging ever waver? Did the Son of God have to keep reminding himself of who he was and whose he was? Did he have hours or days or weeks when he forgot? At his baptism, Jesus heard the absolute truth about who he was. At our baptism, we hear the absolute truth about who we are. But that's the easy part. The much harder part comes in the desert when Jesus had to face down every vicious, mocking assault on that truth. There, Jesus learned that God's deep and unconditional love would never depend on external circumstances. How often have I preferred miraculous interventions? The dramatic rescue, the long-awaited vindication, how often have I found myself echoing the demands of the tempter? Feed me. Deliver me. Prove yourself to me. How often have I found the restraint and the delay of God offensive? Sometimes we, like Jesus, need long stints in the wilderness to learn what it really means to be God's children. Because the unnerving truth is this. We can be loved and uncomfortable at the same time. We can be loved and vulnerable at the same time. In the wilderness, the love that survives is flinty, not soft. Salvific, not sentimental. Learning to trust it takes time, a long time. There are also angels in the wilderness. Even in the land of shadow and starvation, even in the place where the wild beasts roamed, God's agents of love and care lingered with Jesus. This, too, is a startling and comforting truth. One we can recognize if we open our eyes and we just take a look around. Even in the grimmest places, God abides, and somehow, without reason or without explanation, help comes, rest comes, solace comes. Granted, our angels don't always appear in the forms which we prefer, but they come. I wonder what Jesus' angels looked like. Did they manifest as winged creatures from heaven? or as a comforting breeze across the sun-scorched desert, or a trickle of water for a parched throat, or a swirl of the constellations on a clear, cloudless night. What do your angels look like? Do you recognize them when they show up, when they minister to you, when they hold you, brace you, 
Do you hear the new version of God's voice calling you beloved? If yes, then what would it be like to enter into someone else's barren desert right now and become an angel for their journey? As we begin our journey into Lent, may we experience the companionship of the Christ whose vulnerability became his strength. May we enter with courage the deserts that we cannot choose or avoid. May our long stints amidst the wild beasts teach us who we really are, the precious and beautiful children of God. And when the angels, in all their sweet and secret guises, whisper the name Beloved into our ears, may we listen and believe them. Amen. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord's only Son, and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the lasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. In Jesus, your realm has come near to us in every place and time. Give your church throughout the world a spirit of humility and repentance. Teach us to trust always in the good news of your salvation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You have made a covenant of mercy with every living creature. Protect all the Earth's creatures from destruction. Empower the work of biologists, conservationists, and science educators. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All your paths are steadfast love and faithfulness. Direct the words and actions of leaders in our community and throughout the world, that they may maintain justice for the lowly. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Even in the wilderness, you are with us. Walk alongside migrants and refugees crossing dangerous lands. Tend to those whose lives feel desolate. Give healing and strength to all who suffer, especially Jim, Ellen, Ken, Stu, Steve, Catherine, Bob, Michelle and Ryan, Jill, Jackie, Kim and Marshall, Katie, George, Jaron, Tony, Patsy, Rick, Mark, and Stacy. Terry, Tim, Scott, Marie, Robert, Marissa, John, Roger, Marilyn, Scott, Susan, George, Susan, Donna, Glenn, Michael and Teresa, Jory and Lester, Mike. Kirsten, Ryan, Ryan and Connor, Ron, Joel, Judy, George, Larry, Sheila, Charles, Nancy, Amanda, Jim, Rick, Kathy, Laura, Joe, Ellen, Randy, Paul, Umberto, Tom, Karen, Debbie, Ellen, John, Monica, Cam, Joel, Jeff, Holly, Stephanie, Brett, Jean, Donna, Jean. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In the covenant of baptism, you claim us as beloved children. Nurture us in our baptismal identity and teach us to live within it for the sake of others. 
Strengthen this congregation's ministries of care and concern. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In baptism, you join us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We praise you for all those who have died trusting in your faithfulness. Bring us with them to the fullness of your reign. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you feed us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal, that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Now let us pray together in the words which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace this day and forever. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us to you in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity.
in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Thank you.